Andre Pinar. I was the DP on um, Elia, Princess of R&B. I'm nominated for the um, TV film. Elia, Princess of R&B, is about um, an R&B singer uh, who died very young in a plane crash, and uh, she was um, she had achieved a lot of fame at the time. And uh, so this is a story which uh, shows her throughout her life from the age of 10 when she first won or was doing well in music singing competitions. And then it shows her up to the time, uh, the time that she died. The, the approach that I, I took and I think maybe why they hired me for this film was um, to, give, to give it a cinematic approach rather than a a sort of R&B music approach. Uh, I think they wanted to give it a bit of style and a bit of elegance to give the film um, a, a bigger feel than just a, a small TV film. I think that's what they were aiming for and what we were aiming for. So I wanted there to be a sense of reality and naturalism, especially in her home life. We showed Ilya in her home environment as well as in her public life. And they were kind of, they were quite different. Um, so we showed, I wanted the lighting and the, and the cinematic, the, I wanted the lighting and the photographic style to be very naturalistic um, while she was at home. But then when she got out in public, we livened it up and it became a, lo a lot more lively and more, a bit more bling to it. Um, so we had sort of two, two kind of looks. Um, and, if, and also as she progressed, uh, in her career and got more and more famous and um, uh, we gave it just that much more sort of more lighting and more you know just a little more Hollywood you know I use all sorts of cameras um, I'm not I'm not a specifically a fan of any one I, I like to choose camera based on the job that I'm doing cameras and lenses depend depend on the look and the, for this um, and for my last two films I chose to use the Alexa, the Arri Alexa, with uh, Primo prime lenses. Um, they give a particularly classic look. I like their softness and their reality. Um, I, I, I like what Primos do um, to faces. I think they're very, um, they're very forgiving and, and very, uh, they're soft lenses, and yet they're sharp, yet they're soft. Uh, which is what I really like about Primos. If I was a fan of any particular lenses, I'd say Primos are my, fr my favorite. I feel like, you know, I don't get there alone. I, I think it's such a team, a team effort making films. I mean, it's very much a group effort. And um, so I'm, I'm here, I think, through the support, from, due to the support of everyone around me, my crew, even my agent, the people at Cessna, uh, everybody. Um, you know, the directly, director, Bradley Walsh, was very in, uh, interested in a good-looking image and a, and a style, so we worked together, there was a lot of collaboration. Um, and then in, in terms of the crew, I mean, my whole crew was amazing. I had great operators, uh, Andreas Evdeman and Rob Barnett, I had a great grip, um, Rico Emerson, and really an incredible job was done by my gaffer, Terry Banting. Um, he and I just had a really great time on this film. We collaborated, and you know, he kept me kept me honest. You know, at times when I was ready to to shoot, he'd say, you know, no, I don't think it's good enough. We've got to make this better. So I like that. You know, he was you know, relentless. So um, I, a particular thanks to Terry for for this. You know what I was saying about the difference between um, her home life and her show life. I, I, we did all, we did most of her home life, we shot handheld and in a very intimate way. And then her public life and particularly her stage life, we shot a little more classically. A lot of crane and dolly moves and steady cam. We did a lot of handheld too, but I think we gave it a lot of classic treatments. We had a limited number of cameras. It wasn't a big, you know, it wasn't a big budget. We didn't have a lot of time. I mean, there was a lot of work to do. So we had to keep it simple, uh, with you know only a few angles uh, that we had time for. So I think the biggest challenge was time and money. 
Uh, I got the producer, Steve Solomus, to trust me in, in hiring a really great lighting designer for the stage work because we didn't have I didn't have time to pre-light. I had to light under instruction. I had to instruct our lighting designer and, and you know, collaborate with him. And then, um, and then he would light it, and you know, uh, and then I'd have a, you know a couple of hours to tweak that and make it my own before getting this. So it was a challenge. Time and money is always the challenge. I'm Brett Van Dyke, and I was nominated for King Tut Unmasked and uh, Best Docudrama. Basically, they wanted to figure out in one hour how King Tut actually died. There's so many theories on how he did die, and they want to kind of BBC wanted to get to the bottom of actually how he did die. Absolutely, I think main, the main challenge is probably working in Egypt, working in the heat was one thing. And yeah, we were about inches from King Tut, from his sarcophagus, from actual the mummified body. Um, the challenge is, they, they brought me onto this show. I don't usually do docudrama, I do more uh, uh, commercials, long format, but they wanted to bring a more of a cinematography approach to, the, to a docudrama. You didn't want a guy, uh, ENG, throwing a camera on his shoulder. So we composed, we shot with primes. The, the ENG stuff, we needed to use zoom lenses for quick and speed and, and have flexibility, but then we actually composed, did some great filtration, and composed our beautiful landscape frames. Lots of time lapse, lots of Movi, lots of handheld, so dollies, sliders. I basically never turned a light on unless we went into a tomb. Used big bounces, big gold lames, 12 by 20s. It was basically a big grip show. The grips worked the hardest, negs and, and big bounces, and that was about it. We originally wanted to shoot a Mira, uh, area Mira, but the Mira was not available. It was only going to be available two months after that, so we saw, went with Sony F55, mainly because of the high frame rate. We were wanting to shoot a lot of 200 frames, really high speed photography, so that was a workhorse that we could still throw the Cabrio lenses on, on the shoulder, BNG, BNG, and still shoot with beautiful Cook Primes as well. So it had the versatility of both, being a dock camera and you know, a, a full frame 30, 35 mil sensor camera. We shot 4K, uh, 200 frames, and then still did all the documentary part that we needed to with the uh, you know, Cabrio zoom lenses on the 55. And I think originally they went through my agent, but thanks to probably Jeremy Benning, who wasn't available to shoot the show, who had shot with Tom many times, put my name into the hat. I had a Skype meeting with Tom, we hit it off, and I uh, got the job. Well, I, they wanted, they, they wanted their new findings on Tut, on the DNA of how he actually did die. So that's why BBC commissioned this film to actually go out and, and put all the scenarios to the test on these theories of how he died. So we went out and shot all these theories and came to the conclusion. And you got to watch the film to, to see. I would absolutely say my first assistant camera who pulled his weight, shot B camera, went off and shot B roll for us, uh, had the movie ready when we needed it. <laughs> You know, and, and, and you know, humping the, humping the crane with the local crew to the highest point the director could point to, those guys deserve definitely the uh, credit for this award. I think that most guys that deserve the mention of the, uh, the grips and the electrics that worked in Egypt. These guys worked, I think I had about 10 guys, and they worked their butts off in the hot sweat. They always had a tent over us when we needed it, kept us out of the sun. So that was, um, uh, anywhere I put the camera on my shoulder and hiked it up to the top of the mountain, there was a tent over us, so I think those guys deserve the credit. These guys don't even work in Union, I'm telling you, these guys are out of Cairo, and they're just like, I think they do a lot of things in life as well as work for the film industry. Uh, my name is David Green, uh, and I was nominated for 12 Monkeys. It was interesting, it was one of the first times I've ever done a telephone interview, and it was quite unusual, I have to say. Uh, you know, I was at the cottage, and uh, you know, there was, uh, Oh, about six people, all producers on the line, and you know, I just, uh, I just, I just, uh, you know, we just sort of struck a chord with each other. You know, I, th I think that's generally how it works. You know, people, people uh, in this business sort of gravitate together because they they have common interests. They they see things similarly. Um, it's how I hire people. You get a feeling, you know, and. And, you know, they like my work, and, and so, you know, it, it grew from that. You know, I think the biggest thing uh, for a cinematographer in a series, you know, when you're starting it up, when you have big sets that are being built, and at the same time you're trying to plan what you need to do. Uh, so it's a bit of a, it's always a bit daunting because, you know, it's not built yet, it's not a location, you're not, you know, you don't see it yet. Uh, it's a bit abstract, so it's, it's a constant 
conversation with everyone to make sure that what you're planning uh, suits what they're planning. And, and so, you know, that's, that's always the biggest challenge on a series, is, is just the bigger sets, making sure that you're, you're covered. Yeah, VFX scenes, stunt scenes, they always have their challenges. It's, it's an inherent aspect of, uh, uh, of those elements, you know. So, uh, you know, what are the challenges we ran into? Um, you know, we, we had to, well, one of the bigger things is that we had to create this dystopian society, and our VFX team, you know, and our, our, our production designer and, you know, art, art department team really work together to, you know, the art department would give us certain elements and then the, the VFX would take it, take it further for us, you know. Um, you know, so it was, we had a 3D model of the Hearn uh, built, which was great, so we could always access that if we needed it, um, which we use a lot of. So, you know, for their, from their point of view, that was a very complicated aspect, like to build it, build the Hearn exterior, and then, uh, and then, you know, break it down the way it would be in the future, you know, you know 50, 60 years from now. Uh, it was quite a challenge for them. Uh, we use the uh, Aerie Alexa and uh, Cook uh, S5 lenses. Uh, the show actually was posted in LA, uh, and uh, it was at Encore from uh, the like the visual side, and uh, and you know the post production facilities. I'm not sure exactly where they were, but they were all in LA. So. You know, I'm always very supported by uh, my good buddy Dave Sheridan. You know, and Robert Stecco, who's a new uh, camera operator I worked with this year, and. You know, those guys are, you know, you feel comfortable when, you, when they're with you on the floor. They really, they really, uh, they really deserve to be here with me tonight. Uh, my name is uh, Doug Coe, uh, Douglas Coe, and uh, I'm a cinematographer and I'm nominated for The Grand Seduction, which is a theatrical feature film. Well, The Grand Seduction is a uh, comedy. It's based on a, it's a, basically an English language uh, remake of a Quebec film, of uh, La Grand Seduction. And uh, it's basically a real sort of fun, uh, old-fashioned kind of style comedy uh, set in Newfoundland. Well, I got on this. Uh, I got on this film because a good friend of mine, Don McKellar, who I've done numerous projects with before, was the director of the film, which is basically how I got on it. The main sort of inspiration is, uh, 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 you know, for cinematography was the place itself. It's obviously a really stunningly beautiful place. We did decide early on that we didn't want to play it as all sort of desaturated and faded looking which is a bit which has been done sort of quite a lot in films that are shot there so we actually sort of took up on the color of the place it's an extremely colorful place actually in the summertime and so we sort of played that up and that was a big sort of inspiration for us most of the challenges were sort of normal I mean uh, what you run into uh, working around water is always difficult because we were shooting on the uh, uh, shooting in coastal villages and things so yeah, we're doing like boat-to-boat -boat things and stuff. That can get sort of a bit sticky and take a bit longer than you think. And uh, yeah, that, that, those were sort of the biggest challenges. Some sort of bigger night work we had to do there. And the towns are very dark. There's just a couple of street lights in the entire village sometimes. So we really had to kind of light the place up. Unlike, say, shooting in a city like Toronto or Vancouver, where at nighttime there's tons of light around. This place was black as a coal mine you know, when you try to shoot. So it was a bit more work that way sometimes, yeah. <laughs> well, the first choice was a camera system, really. We used the Arri Alexa, and uh, it's my favorite camera, and it was also seemed extremely appropriate there uh, for this film, too, just because we were anticipating a lot of very contrasty situations, a lot of uh, really high dynamic, you know, high dynamic range situations, and the camera's really great for that, of being able to maintain lots of detail and really dramatic bright skies and we're in a lot of places that were difficult to light sometimes where it was uh, you know very small spaces like I banged my head into the ceiling like a million times our first AD who was must have been six foot four or six foot five he wore a hard hat half the time I swear because he was banging his head all the time oh well I you know it would be hard to to pick one person they all worked really really hard it was very tough uh, things were very far apart uh, I don't know, the gaffer, Paul Vio, he was great. I'd never worked with any of these guys before. They were all from Montreal. And uh, uh, Keith Kerr, the grip, fantastic. I would work with him any day. And the focus puller, Matthew DeCary, he was really great. Um, I mean, the thing with Matthew was I never ever had to worry about this guy at all. And there was a lot of wide open shooting, very shallow focus. And he's a real pro. He has more gray hair than I do. And uh, yeah, you just didn't even have to think about it. So I don't know, it would, uh, they were all great. It would be hard to single one of them out. All right, I'm Ray Dumas. I'm a cinematographer and I'm nominated for uh, the short dramatic category. 
the film that I did is called End of War, um, 10 minutes short, and it's about the last 10 minutes of World War I. The inspiration for this film uh, was basically older style cinema that you would have seen coming out of England in the 50s, 60s, David Lean kind of stuff. Uh, we wanted to make something very cinematic. So when I met with the producers about this film, we wanted to make something that was more classical, uh, very wide framing, um, and inspired by films such as David Lean in the 1950s. From a technical standpoint, uh, we went with the red uh, dragon on this one. Um, I was going to be doing a lot of moving camera work, uh, steady cam, and I needed a lighter camera. Uh, we had some effects, so going to 5K made sense for us. We were doing some um, additional uh, matte paintings and explosions in the background, so we wanted a very rich image. Um, Lensing, I actually used my own lenses. I used Cooks, which are made in England and have a very beautiful soft look and take away a bit of the digital grittiness that you see on a lot of modern lensing. Um, and it lent itself towards this project. So that, that technically that's where we went. I'd say that probably the most challenging scene in this particular film was recreating trench warfare um, on the, on the uh, German front. We, we actually dug trenches on the director's uh, parents' farmland, and budget, the, the biggest challenge was budgetarily. We did not have the money to make real-time huge explosions, uh, so we had to frame down in the trenches, and we had a lot of people outside throwing material up in the air, and sound design, the combination of sound design, lighting, and basic tricks like smoke, we made it look quite rich and, and, and real based on that. Uh, my name is Kevin Fraser and I'm nominated for Best Documentary Cinematography for a project called 28 Feet Life on a Little Wooden Boat. Uh, well, I just made it myself, so I actually wasn't selected per se. Um, the subject's a really good friend of mine and I wanted to make a documentary about him, so I was both the director and DP for this project. The biggest challenge with shooting this documentary um, was not any particular scene, but mostly just the fact that I was working on a really small boat. It's uh, 28 feet length overall and only 8 feet wide, and uh, we basically shot the whole film on this little boat um, at sea. Uh, so it was just working around the rig and trying not to fall off and keeping everything dry and not salty. Uh, luckily, we were shooting in the Caribbean, so uh, we traveled through eight islands, and uh, it was actually a pretty relaxing way to make a movie. The subject of the film, uh, David Wellsford, he's a really passionate guy who's basically given up his possessions on land and he lives on this boat full time and travels and he's really, really passionate and he's very brave and just following what he wants to do and I hope that people who watch the documentary get a sense of that and maybe think about what their passions are and consider following them as well. If the nomination becomes an award, there are, well, whether, whether we get the award or not, there are a lot of people who deserve to be thanked. Um, mainly uh, the, David, who is the best subject I've ever worked with, uh, my girlfriend and producer Melanie Wood, who's actually here tonight, and the editor Sean Beckwith, who put so much of his time and his, himself into the project. I had a lot of help in all my projects. A, a, a rental house that I work with a lot is William F. White's, and although for this particular project there wasn't much gear involved, the stuff I did get was from them, and I also got a lot of great advice about rigging things to the boat, and uh, they sent a few tools down with me. Uh, great guys at White's, and also I'm based in Halifax, so uh, the White's guys in the Atlantic region, really top notch.